All right, we are live here. Thank you everybody for joining our first Onyx Office Hours Masterclass. This is gonna be a little bit of a different type of masterclass than what we've done in the past, if you've ever attended any one of those. Typically we have kind of an agenda and a topic, a specific thing we're gonna talk about. These Office Hours ones are intended to kind of be driven by the audience, by you folks. Um, so it's kind of, uh, a free forum type of question and answer session. We did have some people send some questions in when they registered, so we'll go through some of those and then we'll get to some of the questions that are asked live here in the class. If you do have a question you'd like us to address, um, I keep saying us, it's just me on this one. In future classes we'll bring some more folks from the office in here, uh, but if you do have any questions, you want me to try to address during the class, use the Q&A bar down along the bottom of the screen. There's a little box that pops up when you click that. That's the easiest way for me to keep track of those. Um, if you use the chat bar, they just kind of tend to get lost in there as, as they scroll through and, and they're not as easy for me to answer. While we're letting some people roll in here, a couple more housekeeping things. This class is being recorded, so if you have to drop off or you have something you know, something come up where you have to step away, no worries. You'll get an email tomorrow with the full recording. We'll also have this up on our YouTube channel either later today or tomorrow, just depending on how fast uh, Zoom gets the recording available and how fast we're able to get it uploaded to YouTube. So you can go back and watch that. We're also doing a giveaway at the end of the class. We'll post the link in the chat. Um, so we're giving away some Onyx Hunt bandanas. So if you wanna get entered for that, we'll post that link a little bit later on. My name's Jack Headland. I work on the marketing team here at Onyx out of our Missoula, Montana office. So I'll be kind of leading you through this here today. And with that, um, looks like we've got quite a few people here already. So we'll get into, into some of the questions. One of the first registration questions we got was any tips on organize, organization of waypoints and to maximize app performance with too many waypoints on the phone? Great question, especially as people have had Onyx for a number of years, we're marking waypoints, we're saving trails and tracks, the map can get kind of cluttered, and you can have a lot of data on there. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna pull up my map here and show you how I organize my waypoints and give you a couple different ideas for what you can do. So one moment while I pull that up here. So this is the Onyx Maps web map. If you've never looked at this before, it comes with your account. You just go to onyxmaps.com and you log in there. In the upper right hand corner, you'll see a button that says open map. It's the same email and password you use on your phone or on your tablet. So it'll pull up the map, should look familiar to you. You can see this is just a test account I have here. You can see I have some different waypoints saved. So not too many, your map may look a lot more cluttered. But let's say I wanted to organize these waypoints. One thing you can do, if I just select this waypoint I placed earlier today at, you know, it's kind of a random one. This is a, let's say I went out, I saw a four point muley buck, I was out mule deer hunting, and I want to organize all of my, let's say all of my deer spots into one folder. What I can do is I can click on the waypoint, and you can do this on your phone as well, it looks a little bit different, but if you tap on it, you'll have an option to add it to a folder. Now when I click add to folder, I can also select more waypoints from the same menu. So let's say I want to add these waypoints. Let's say those are my deer waypoints, for example, for this hunt. I want to add them to a folder. Now I can add them to an existing folder. I have a test folder. I have one for waypoints over in Minnesota where I grew up. I have an elk folder. I could add it to any of those. I could also make a new folder. So let's say this is a mule deer folder for this year. Now all of those items are added to that folder. So what's cool with folders, if I go over to my content and I go to mule deer, I can say I only want to see these waypoints on the map. So I can click this button here that says only show this folder on the map. 
and you see if I zoom out now, all of those other waypoints are hidden. Okay, so it's only the ones that are in that folder. If I turn that off, you see those other ones pop up. If I wanna hide this folder, let's say I don't wanna see these, I can click hide this folder. Now you see all my other ones are on there and this mule deer folder is hidden. You can kind of see as I toggle that off and on there. So that's one way, that's, that's kind of how I recommend organizing your waypoints. I personally do my folders by species on my personal account. So I have a turkey folder, a bear folder, an elk folder, a deer folder, waterfowl, small game, pronghorn, you know, you can kind of build it out that way. So right now in the fall, I don't have my turkey and bear folders turned on because I filled my turkey and bear tags in the spring season here in Montana. So I'm not really chasing those animals in the fall. So I just have them turned off to open my map up a little bit. Tonight, I'm probably gonna take my two-year-old German wire hair out grouse hunting somewhere around town. I'm probably gonna turn my elk and deer ones off. Um, I just wanna see my grouse spots. So I'm gonna have my, there. I put all my grouse and rabbit and squirrel stuff into a small game folder. So I turn that one on. You can also organize your content by year. Some people will do a folder for 2021, 2022, 2023 and just make sure that you keep up and put all of your 2023 waypoints in the 2023 folder. There's really no wrong way to do it besides maybe not doing it at all. Whatever makes sense to you, whether you do it by species, whether you do it by area, whether you do it by a specific tag that you have, you might have a, you know, a limited entry elk tag this year and you might make a, you know, elk 2023 folder whatever makes sense to you that's the way i recommend organizing your content is by using that folder system that way you can turn stuff off that's not applicable and turn stuff on that is so i hope that helped there let's see next question every time i open the app it has me going through the upgrade process and then when i do it shows i have an existing account great question this is a common issue that we see if you log into your OnX and it's telling you you need to buy a membership, but you already have one, that means that you're logged in with the wrong login credentials. You're either logged in with a different email address, or maybe you set your account up with you know, your Apple login information or your Facebook login information, and now you're logging in with something else. 99 times out of 100, that's what's going on. If, if it tells you you have to upgrade, and then you try to upgrade and it tells you you already have an account. We see that quite a bit. What I would recommend is emailing our customer support team. They answer questions like that all the time. So email help at onxmaps.com. You can find the contact information on our website as well. You can also give them a call. Area codes 406-540-1600. You can give them a call during regular business hours, Monday through Friday they'll help you get it straightened out. They'll be able to track down what you would use to set up your account and then get logged in correctly there. When do we update the crop data? Another good question there. So I'm gonna pull up the map here just to give everybody kind of a look at what, what we're talking about when we mean crop data. This is a relatively new feature still that not everybody knows about. So if I zoom into my map here, I'm gonna get to an agriculture area where I know there's some crop fields. So if I go into my layers, I go to trees, crops, and cover, I turn on the crop distribution, I zoom in, I can see this is alfalfa and hay fields here. So that data comes to us in the, in the winter springtime usually it's about february when we get that updated so this is data from 2022 they're actually doing the surveys right now they're flying over um and you know looking at what is they use these sophisticated aerial cameras to be able to tell what's planted where so they're doing those flyovers right now so we won't have 2023 data until february of 2024 it takes a little bit of time to get that um, updated but february march is when we update that data. So it is last year's data. For something like alfalfa, it was planted in alfalfa last year. 
high likelihood it's going to be alfalfa again this year typically fields stay in alfalfa for a number of years in the midwest if it was soybeans last year it's probably corn this year so if you kind of know the crop rotation if you kind of know how agriculture works in your area you can tell with reasonable you know um certainty that it's gonna what's gonna be planted this year there is some ground truthing that goes into it of course um, but for things like alfalfa hay fields I'd say a pretty good chance it's still alfalfa and hay this year, especially in this part of Western Montana. We don't have a whole lot of diversity in our crops. There's only a kind of a handful of things that are typically grown. Um, you know, like I said, in the Midwest, it's usually corn and soybeans and they're rotating those. So you get a pretty good idea of, uh, of what's gonna be planted. So to answer the question again, crop data is updated in the winter, typically around February, we get the previous year's data and we, we update that. Next question, how do I use Onyx when I don't have cell service? Another great question, it's one we get fairly often. I'm gonna go over to an iPad here so you can see what it looks like on a mobile device. So I'm gonna share my screen over there. One moment while that boots up. So here we are, I'll just deny that for now. And I'm gonna go into my Onyx app here on my tablet. So that's taking a little bit of time, there we go. So if I'm going to an area that doesn't have cell service, what I'm going to do, I'm just gonna move the map up here to the Bob Marshall Wilderness. Never actually been, spent much time in there myself, but not a whole lot of cell service up there in the Bob Marshall. So to use, use Onyx offline, in the lower left-hand corner, I'm tapping where it says Offline Maps, and I'm gonna hit the button that says New Map. That is going to pull up this red box on my screen, and whatever's within that box is what I'm gonna download to my phone. You have a couple different options for resolution, low, medium, and high. I typically use the medium resolution because it's gonna give me about a 20 by 20 box so you know 20 miles by 20 miles it's a pretty good size chunk of terrain and the medium resolution still is enough for me to be able to tell what's going on on the ground um, be able to tell you know tell me what i need to know i'm going to name this map bob marshall you don't have to name it but we recommend you do because once you get a bunch downloaded you want to know where your maps are and what you have saved and then I'm just going to hit the save button. I'm going to dismiss that. And you can see that map is downloading there on my device, whether it's a phone or a tablet. Once that's downloaded, when I go out to that area and I don't have cell service, most of the time what I do is I put my phone into airplane mode so that it saves my battery. And that's going to automatically tell the app to go into offline mode so that it's going to pull up that information and not try to download it via the cell network. You can also leave your phone out of airplane mode and just regular operating mode and tap this go offline button. That also tells the app to go into offline mode and to load up those offline maps. You can save multiple maps. You can see I have a bunch of different ones saved here. You can save as many as your device has room for. Your GPS in your device works whether you have cell service or not, so it's able to locate you. So if I were actually out in the Bob Marshall Wilderness within this saved map, I would still see my blue dot and see where I was. I could zoom in and I could navigate. Let's say I was walking along the river here. I would be able to mark waypoints. I would be able to track myself. I can do basically all the things that I do when I'm online even when I don't have cell service, as long as I have that map saved beforehand. You can see that green box there is, is the map that I have saved. If you don't save the map, you won't be able to see the terrain, the topography, the different layers and things. So you just gotta make sure you do that um, you know, when you, before you leave, when you still have service. I'm going to stop sharing there. So I hope that answered the, the offline map question there. 
how do I get Onyx to show in my vehicle what's the status uh, and what is the status of Android Auto? So right now we are compatible with Apple CarPlay. So if you have an Apple device, typically a phone, some people may use a tablet, and your car has Apple CarPlay in it, make sure you have your app updated to the most up-to-date version of the Onyx app. You can do that just by going to the App Store, searching for Onyx Hunt and checking if there's an update there if you don't have automatic updates turned on. And then you should see, once you connect your device to your in-dash you know, head unit there, whether you have to plug it in or whether it's Bluetooth, you should see Onyx Hunt show up in your apps there tap on it there and it's going to mirror what you see on this on your phone screen it is limited for safety purposes you're not able to like tap on the screen and mark waypoints and things like that just because we don't want you doing that <laughs> while you're driving right but it is going to mirror what you see um, on the phone as far as land ownership and unit boundaries and waypoints and things like that as far as android auto goes we're in the process of testing now um, we kind of had to go back and, uh, you know, we've been working on it for a while. We, we've gone through different parts of testing. We have to make it compatible with the Android Auto requirements as set by Google. So we have to make sure we're checking all of their boxes. We're hoping early October right now. I know that's later than, you know, everybody wants it right now. Um, that's realistically what we're looking at right now, early October, as long as all of the testing goes to plan um, as long as Google approves everything and, and they like what we've built um, and it checks all of their requirements looking at early October for the Android Auto folks. Another question. What's one piece of gear do you have to have on a hunting trip outside of the essential clothes and gear? Good questions. One I haven't really thought about. So outside of, you know, a good pair of boots, my hunting clothes, required tags and licenses and everything. I'm always gonna have a pair of binoculars, even when I'm bird hunting, upland bird hunting waterfall, at least in the truck. I love to have those. I was just out in Eastern Montana, um, hunting sage grouse, sharp tail grouse. And there were times where we would, especially for sage grouse, where we would kind of park up on a high spot and glass, we were finding them in the edges of agriculture and kind of glass them up, especially the night before a hunt when we're just out scouting. Um, so binoculars is one thing. That might be, some people would be like, that's a no brainer, that's an essential piece of gear. Um, beyond that, you know, I always have obviously Onyx on my phone. I'm gonna have a wind checker with me. Even when I'm, we were out there with my dog, it was tough to tell, it was really still mornings, but I could still puff my wind checker and see kind of what way the wind was blowing so that we could make sure the dog was was hunting into the you know, into the wind as much as possible. Uh, so I would say, you know, besides my clothing, my weapon, my tags, my licenses, um, binoculars, wind checker, things like that, pretty necessary, at least for the way I like to hunt. Methods for charging my phone while in the backcountry for multiple days. So great question. So if I'm going on a multi-day backpacking style hunt, first thing I'm going to do with my phone is I'm going to put it in airplane mode. The two biggest draws on your phone's battery are the screen and searching for cell towers, searching for signal. That one's really going to run it down. If you're in an area where there's maybe a little bit of service or there's no service at all, if it's trying to find a cell tower, that's going to run your battery down. So put it in airplane mode. If you use the screen sparingly, especially on some newer phones, if your battery's still good, you can get a couple of days out of it, even running on X when you're in airplane mode. I always carry at least one external power bank or, or charging pack, whatever you want to call it. I've got some, got one from Mophie is one brand, Otterbox, um, trying to think of some other brands. There's a bunch of good brands out there. Uh, Dark Energy is a pretty popular one. They make some real burly ones for backcountry hunters. I've seen them test where they can even drive over it. A lot of them will give you two, three, four charges for you know, a charging bank that's about the size of this iPhone 11 I have, maybe a little bit bigger. That's what I carry. I've never used a solar pack. Um, I've never done that long of a backpacking hunt to have carry like a solar panel. 
I know some people do. I think Goal Zero is a pretty popular brand for those. So that's something you might test out. Um, otherwise, the combination of keeping the phone in airplane mode and having a charging pack or two um, in my backpack, that's what I would recommend for most most backpack hunts, unless you're doing a, you know, seven plus day extended hunt, something like that, then you maybe want to look at a, a foldable solar panel. Is there a way to make a circle around a waypoint? I think what this question is getting at is to be able to mark an area, a certain distance away from a certain waypoint. And there is, I'm going to pull that up here. Let me share my screen again. So you can do this on both mobile and on web. Zoom is not liking me today. Let's try one more time. There we go. So I'm going to mark a waypoint. I'm just going to pick a random spot here. I'm going to add a waypoint. I'm going to hit save. So once I have my waypoint saved on your mobile app, on your phone, you can just tap on the waypoint and then you scroll down in that card a little bit. On web map, you can see I just clicked on this waypoint and I have this card that pulls up. What we're looking for here is the waypoint radius. If I click on that, it's going to be automatically set to 100 yards. So you can see I now have kind of two circles on my map showing 50 yards and 100 yards. You can make this miles if you want and have it be set to one mile and apply that. And you can see how big that circle is. I can go back in and change this. Let me go back to 50 yards. So let's say this was a tree stand that I placed and I'm archery deer hunting and I know I'm not gonna shoot more than 50 yards, I can kind of see, all right, what am I really covering as far as 50 yards from this potential tree stand spot? What am I able to shoot? Is, am I able to cover the area I want or not? Maybe I need to change. Also super useful for states where you have kind of setback rules or safety zones, where let's say you can't shoot within 450 yards of a building or 400 yards of a building. Every state's a little different. Make sure you, you know, you know the regulations there. Sometimes it's an occupied dwelling. Again, there's 50 different states. There's probably 50 different rules for this. Let's say this was a, a house here, a yard. I need to stay 450 yards away from it, for example. Now I know this is kind of that exclusion zone where I can't discharge a firearm or, or something like that. So that waypoint radius tool, you can toggle it off and on really quickly. That's how you do that. Good question there. Let's see, we got a couple more here before we get to the live ones. Identifying oak trees on the satellite image. I can do you one better than on the satellite image. One moment here. So you may have remembered earlier, I pulled up the trees, crops, and cover folder. What you can do, instead of using satellite imagery, you can go into your layers. And again, this is available on mobile as well. Go into the layers, go down to the trees, crops, and cover folder. And there's a couple ways you can do this. You can turn on your deciduous tree distribution. That's going to show you, you can select seven different classes of deciduous trees. Alder maple, aspen birch, oak gum cypress, oak hickory, depending on what you want to see. If I'm just looking for oak trees for deer hunting, for example, concerned about the acorns, I'm going to turn on acorn producing oaks. What this layer shows is oak trees capable of producing acorns, meaning they're mature enough because some oak species don't start dropping acorns until 10, 15, 20 years old. Out here around Missoula, Montana, not very many oak trees. So I'm gonna to move to a spot that I think should show up for us here, kind of in central Minnesota. Should be some oak trees in this area. 
I'm going to turn off my crop layer just to clear things up a bit. So here you see this, this kind of different coloration here in these woods. These are white oak trees. Now each one of these boxes is about 30 by 30 meters, and that is showing the dominant tree species in that, that, that pixel, for example, that 30 by 30 meter square area. So is it all going to be white oaks in here? Not necessarily, but that's the dominant species. And I can tell this area um, is full of white oaks. In your area, it might say red oaks. Um, that's what I would use versus just trying to look at imagery to try to tell, hey, what kind of trees are those? You know, I can obviously tell these are somewhat mature trees. It's a pretty full canopy. I can tell they're deciduous trees by looking at it. But me personally, I'm not able to tell for sure that these are white oaks without this acorn producing oak layer mentioned earlier you can turn on the coniferous and this is oak hickory type forest there's some aspen and birch mixed in there as well so a couple different ways that you can use the this trees crops and cover folder to be able to tell what kind of tree is in a certain area a couple more here i'm a private landowner how do I correct a mapping error with your program? So I'm going to zoom out. I'm just going to pick a spot here. We're in Minnesota. Let me share my map again. So let's say you do find a piece of a, a piece of land that we have mislabeled. Maybe the, the land has recently transferred ownership, something like that. I'm just picking a random spot here. Let's say that I know that this LLC no longer owns this piece of land. On your phone, you can just tap on it and it'll pull up a similar card along the bottom. You might have to scroll over a little bit. There will be an option that says report an error. Then we'll ask for some information there. Private land. Let's say the landowner name has changed. Then you can tell if you know who the the correct landowner is. Let's just say it's John Smith, just to make up a generic name here. Not going to hit submit because this would actually go to our mapping team. But once you have the correct information, the more information you can provide us, the better. That helps our mapping folks. They will go to typically the county or county equivalent. Will go to that government site and try to verify. So we always verify this just so, you know, somebody can't go and say, man, Jack Headland, I own all this land and submit it all. We're not just gonna take you at your word and say, all right, Jack Headland, you own all this land and change it, right? We always have to verify with the kind of the governing or man managing agency. We'll go check with them. They'll say, yep, this is John Smith. They purchased it a month ago. Then we'll work to get that updated. If we can't verify it, We'll go to as many different sources as we can. Typically, we do stick with, you know, the county government. They're kind of the, the source of truth on that. But that's how you would report an error. You can also do it on public land. If something's labeled as public and you're like, man, I think this is private, you can do that as well. Um, so that's the way to, to report an error. A couple more questions here that people sent in. How do I locate shelves that elk may rest on? So good question. Another term for this would be a bench. You often hear that elk like to bed in benchy areas. I'm gonna go back to my map here. I'm gonna share, I'm gonna get out of Minnesota. Minnesota does have elk in the far Northwestern corner, but uh, pretty limited hunting here. So let's get out to Western Montana. I'm just gonna pick a spot I've never hunted here. I'm going to turn off a couple of layers just to to make it things a little bit easier to see i'm going to turn off this wildfire layer just to clear things up one thing i would use if i'm looking for that benchy kind of cover the first thing i would look for the benchy terrain i should say i'm going to go to this land and access folder in my layers again you can do this on the mobile device everything i'm showing you here for the most part you can do on your phone or on your tablet I'm going to turn on the slope angle layer. Now you can see 
The kind of greener areas are flatter, up to yellow, orange, red, and purple. This is real steep stuff. So what I might be looking for here is I can tell that this area, especially if it doesn't have any shading, is basically flat. These are areas elk are more likely to bed, especially kind of that classic north facing. There's this ridge here, it kind of runs down to the north. It's nice and flat. You can see it drops off pretty steep here. That might be an area that holds elk. We know through studies elk don't like to bed on a slope that's more than, I think they saw a drop off after like 20 or 25 degrees. If it's steeper than that, and you can imagine yourself trying to lay down on that and rest during the middle of the day, it's not gonna be as comfortable as these flatter areas. So that would be the first thing I would look at. I mean, you can also just kind of tell based on the topo lines, the farther spaced out they are, the flatter the terrain, you know, this might be an area that holds elk. I've never actually been there. Of course, we've all probably had that. If you've elk hunted, you've probably scouted out a spot and you're like, man, this has everything an elk would want. And you get up there and there's no elk, right? There's still animals and you still gotta, still gotta, you know, ground truth some of this and actually go out there and set boots on the ground. But, you know, I would say it's more likely they're gonna bed in something like this than that they're gonna bed in something like this where it's really steep. So I would use that slope angle layer to get started there uh, to try to find those areas. Let's do one more of these. Help with finding timber cuts. Good question. So animals of all different types like to use logged areas, whether it's elk and deer, because there's that fresh green growth, because the canopy's been disturbed, whether it's grouse, because they like those thick aspen areas where it's been logged a few years ago, and now there's that thick stem count for cover, brood rearing habitat. Timber cuts are a great place to hunt. A couple different options here for you for finding them. You can go to the trees, crops, and cover and turn on the timber cuts layer. That is gonna show you logging that has taken place on public land. So I'm gonna go, I'm just gonna go back to Minnesota to a spot where I know there's been some logging in recent years. So for example, this is on that Forest Service land. This is the timber cuts layer, okay? And it's showing me this cut took place. It's gonna take a little bit to load up here. There we go. This cut took place in 2017. Single tree selection cut, meaning they were, they were probably just harvesting a certain type of tree. In this case, I think they were harvesting aspen, um, or as we call it in the upper Midwest, popple. So it tells me, you know, the acreage, when it was cut. I can also go over, there was one in 2015. Here's another one in 2015. Depending on the state, Minnesota, for example, also has this forest disturbance. So let me find an area that's not. So here's some tax forfeit county managed land. This was logged in 2015. Pennsylvania is another state where we have this information for state, or I should say non-federal logging projects. So most states, the only place we have this data from is from the US Forest Service on national forest land. The Minnesota DNR, the Pennsylvania, I believe it's the Game Commission, they keep track of the logging that's taken place on state lands, in this case, county lands, sometimes even private lands. They will have that information. Not every state has that. So you might wanna check your state folder to see if that's in there as well and you can turn that off and on. So that's the best way, in my opinion, to find those timber cut layers. All right, let's get into, we have, looks like we've got almost 50 questions asked here. I won't have time to get to all of those, but I'll get to as many as I can. Let's see. So question, Garrett asked, how do you utilize the crop overlay and tree overlay? We've kind of gone over that. 
You can go in and, and turn them on on your app or on the web map. I typically only use them when I'm scouting. When I'm actually out hunting, I turn them off just to clear my map up a little bit. But this past weekend, we were out hunting sage grouse, sharp tail grouse, Hungarian partridge in eastern Montana. I was turning that on to see where those alfalfa fields were because the few birds we did kill were full of grasshoppers, full of bugs. Alfalfa fields can hold a lot of bugs. So to try to find those for some of those birds was finding wheat fields, which is kind of classic Hungarian partridge territory. So I was turning those on and checking, you know, we were hunting mostly private or excuse me, public lands and private walk-in block management areas. They're called in Montana. That's our, our walk-in access program. Um, so that's how I used the crop layers to just see, hey man, what's planted here? Um, is this an area likely to hold birds or not? Same with the trees. I do that when I'm scouting. If I'm looking, you know, scouting for an archery whitetail hunt, say in September, October, when the acorns are falling, I'll turn on that acorn producing oaks. If I'm looking for uh, rough grouse spots, I'm going to turn on the young aspen stands, try to mark out those areas. And then I'll put waypoints of areas that I want to hunt, areas I want to check out. Then when I'm out there, you know, I turn that layer off just to clear things up a little bit. It's a good question there. Let's see. Is it possible to use numbers and letters instead of the list of symbols when showing waypoint pins on the map? Right now you are limited to our selection of waypoint icons um, on the map. We don't have the ability to make like custom ones or to just say like, hey, I wanna be able to use A through Z or one through 10. Um, but that is a good uh, suggestion just to be able to, to mark letters or numbers. Um, so Michael, thanks for that question. I'll make sure to pass that along to our folks. Uh, maybe that's something we can do in the future. Does hiding all the pins in a certain folder increase on phone speed or performance? Good question, Sean. It can. Um, if you're only talking about hiding a couple of waypoints, you're not going to see a big difference. On my personal account, I think I have almost 1,500 waypoints. So that is part of the reason I do hide the non-necessary ones, just because every piece of information the app has to load takes a little bit of time. So if I can hide a couple hundred of those waypoints, it's not a massive improvement in how fast the map loads, but it is, it is a little bit noticeable. So I do hide the ones that I don't need. Just don't forget about them. Um, we've had some people say, man, I lost all of my waypoints from 2021. I can't find them anywhere. And it's because they'd hidden the folder and didn't remember that it was hidden. So if you do, you know, come back into the app and you're looking for something and you can't find it, check to make sure you don't have any filters turned on or you don't have any of those folders hidden. Um, you know, would hate for you to have an unnecessary stress there thinking something's been lost. If you do, that brings me to another point. If you do accidentally delete something or maybe it's on purpose and you'd like to have it back we can restore waypoints tracks any markups that have been deleted our customer support team shoot them an email again that's help at onyxmaps.com you we can restore those so that they'll be able to go back in and you said hey i had you know all these waypoints they were deleted we can go back in and restore those we can't see where they are or anything like that another question we get man can onyx employees see all my waypoints we can't, we can't see any of that information where it was placed or things like that. We're just able to restore the deleted ones that they pop back up on your map. Let's see. There's a few questions in here, very specific account questions. Without being able to dig into your account or really looking at um, you know, what's going on with your specific account and map, I'm not going to be able to answer those, unfortunately. I just don't have some of the tools. Our customer support team has don't have the time to really dig into things here. So if you do have, you know, an account specific question, you're encountering something that doesn't look quite right, or you have, you know, a billing question, a question about passwords, things like that, um, email help at onyxmaps.com or give us a call 406-540-1600. Customer support team will be better able to answer those questions. They're the experts at it. Um, if you send an email, you're going to get a response within 24 business hours. Usually it's much faster than that. So I apologize. I won't be able to answer all of those questions here. Um, 
but give them a shout. They'll be able to take care of you. Common question here, Don asks, how accurate are the property lines on the programs? The property lines are as accurate as what we get from the county or from our data source. When we get that data from a county or county equivalent, they will usually send it to us with the disclaimer that there is a margin for error. Some counties will say the margin for error is 25 feet. I've seen it up to like 100 yards because they're, you know, trying to, to set realistic expectations, I guess, and also just be like, hey, this isn't survey grade. Typically, we find property boundaries most of the time within five to 10 feet. You may find that they are shifted a bit um, because, you know, the complexities of building the map with putting, um, you know, the earth is round on a flat surface and then putting imagery on there and then putting that property boundary on top things can get shifted around a little bit when it's visualized that way. Usually five to 10 feet is what I have found and what we found across the country. If you do find something where a property line is way off, you know, where it's off by a hundred feet or more um, or something that's just not acceptable to you, use that uh, error reporting feature. You can report that, hey, all the property lines in this area are shifted 50 yards to the west or 60 yards to the southeast or something like that, our mapping team will go in there, take a look at what's going on and, and work to get that corrected. Is Onyx up to date in the plots areas in North Dakota? We should have the most up to date um, public land open to sportsmen information for North Dakota. They've got seasons open right now. So North Dakota Game and Fish does provide us with those plots areas. So we do have the data for 2023 in there. Again, if you find something that is incorrect, um, you know, let us know about it. Use that error reporting feature, and we'll uh, we'll take a look at that. Get in contact with North Dakota Game and Fish and, and get any errors corrected. Um, using the in dash option in the hunting rig, does it show property ownership? Yes, it does. As long as you have the private lands layer turned on on your phone it will show up on the in dash in your truck or in your car so whatever you have turned on on the phone that's what's going to show up in the in dash if you would have all of those layers turned off it's going to be a pretty basic map so whatever you want to see on the in dash you have to have turned on on the phone Let's see barry asks can you put subfolders under a folder not yet that's something that's been talked about. Um, hopefully in the future, we'll be able to do that. I would love to have you know, an elk folder, for example, and then have 21 elk, 22 elk, 23 elk, so that I could take a look at, you know, if I typically hunt the same area, what things looked like last year, the year before, for, ex for example. A lot of different use cases for subfolders. We're not there yet, hopefully sometime in the future. Good question. Any plan to be able to edit the color or icon for multiple waypoints? So editing the color and the icon is something I recommend you do in addition to doing my folders by species. I do my icon colors by species. So I can tell, you know, my dear ones are that basic kind of reddish orange that is chosen by default. My bare spots are blue because I like alliteration. My um, kind of miscellaneous ones, parking areas, um, kind of non-hunting specific things that I want to mark, I do white. We don't have the option to do like a mass, you know, select all of these, make them all this color, or this icon. That's another great suggestion there, Jeremy. I will write that down and, and pass that along. Especially if you're, you know, if you've marked a whole bunch of waypoints and you're trying to go back later and change the color, um, super useful. One thing I do recommend when you're marking waypoints, just do it right away. Um, I've done that when I'm out in the field and I see a rub, for example, and I just hit the mark my location and it gives me the generic X. And then I go back, sometimes it's a week later, sometimes it's a month or a year later. And I'm like, what was that? I, I don't know what I marked there because I was in the heat of the moment, I just marked it. Take the 10, 15 seconds, go in there, at least write, you know, elk rub, change to the rub icon, change the color. Um, so that you don't have to go back later and wonder what it was. 
Uh, Raymond asks, when upgrading from a single state, that's our premium membership to an elite, do you get credit for that single state membership? Yes, you do. We'll prorate your upgrade. So if you decide to go from a premium one state or a premium two state up to elite, um, your membership will be prorated. You do want to make sure you're upgrading through the same method that you purchased your membership. So a lot of people will buy a membership through iTunes, for example, or Google Play on their phone, they'll buy premium, and then later they'll go to our website and buy Elite. Those are two different billing systems. So they don't talk to each other. So if you go to our website and you buy the Elite when you already had premium, our billing system doesn't know that you had premium through iTunes or Google Play, for example, and it'll charge you the full price. So if you purchase through iTunes, you'll wanna upgrade there. If you purchase through our website, you'll wanna upgrade there. If you have any doubts, our customer support team, I know I've been plugging them a lot. They truly are the best. Um, give them a shout and say, hey, I want to upgrade to Elite, but I don't want to you know, lose out on the credit for the, the premium membership I had. They'll take care of you. They'll get you prorated um, and get you upgraded to Elite if that's what you'd like to do. Don asks, is it possible to change the colors on offline map boundaries, like being able to change the colors of the waypoints? It's not right now. It is that kind of lime green color for those saved offline maps. If you see an offline map that has, looks like a candy cane, red and white striped, that is not a different color. Well, it is, but that is signifying that that map is not downloaded onto your device. So if you want to use that area, you want to make sure you download that. Any of your offline maps that are saved on your device will show with that green color. And right now there's not a way to change that, but that's another good suggestion. I will pass along. Let's see. Are there other handheld GPS devices that I can use with Onyx? I have a few Garmin GPS. Is there a way to use Onyx on them? Tyler, good question. Um, the answer is kind of yes and no. Onyx as a company actually started with GPS chips that went into Garmin, certain Garmin devices, ones that were compatible. So we had like a physical micro SD card you would put in there. We're kind of moving away from that right now. That chip product is kind of going away. Um, and we're focusing exclusively on the app right now. So we do still have some of those older chips that you can purchase on our website or by, by contacting us directly, we can get one sent out to you for your state. They are no longer updated. So we did, we did update a few states last year. 2022 was the last, date, last year um, any states were updated. So you can still buy one. It'll still show you, you know, the private and public lands from the last time it was updated. But like I said, as a company, we're, we're kind of moving away from that towards the phone app. That's kind of our focus moving forward. And that's what I recommend. The phone app has so many more features, um, is updated so much more often than we, than we could update the chip in the past. So that's the direction I would recommend going. Uh, Paul asked, my property lines are running through buildings. How do I correct this? Um, we talked about the error reporting feature. That's a good use case for that. If the, if the imagery or the property line is shifted, um, use that error reporting feature. We'll take a look at it, get it corrected. How do you sync your phone and laptop? Um, so they sync up automatically. Anything that I did on the web map um, earlier when I was screen sharing there will sync up to my iPad that I have here um, or to my phone that I'm logged in there and vice versa. Anything I do on my phone, when I come home and log into my computer and log into the web map, everything I marked as far as waypoints will show up there. Um, you may have to like refresh your browser if you had that window open, or you may have to, in extreme cases, you may have to log out and log back in, but that'll sync up there. Um, if you save an offline map on your web map, if you save that outline, it's not gonna automatically go to your mobile device. So if you save an offline map on web map, open up your mobile device and go into the offline maps menu, you'll see that listed among the list on the bottom there, but it won't be downloaded. You just have to click the download button 
and that will queue it up and you'll have that downloaded onto your mobile device. Let's see. Uh, again, I apologize. I'm not gonna be able to get to all these questions. More are coming in. Um, let's see. Does tracking work when you are not in cell range? Good question, Chris. Yes, it does. Tracker works because um, it's based on the GPS in your phone and the GPS in your phone connects to the satellites in space, similar to a Garmin GPS or Magellan or any of the other brands. Um, so the tracker does work when you don't have cell service, you're able to see your breadcrumb trail there um, and save that track. Let's see. Uh, can you explain the pheasants forever overlay in Minnesota? How do you get the information to say there might be pheasants? So the pheasants forever layer is a nationwide layer. It's not just in Minnesota. I'm actually going to, I'll pull it up here. Give me a moment. Um, so we have a couple different layers that are similar. We have one with the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. We also have one with pheasants forever. And that's not necessarily saying there are pheasants here. What that is showing in the case of the Pheasants Forever layer is that's land that Pheasants Forever has acquired or conserved um, somehow. So this is an area that's well known um, kind of in Montana, this Coffee Creek property that Pheasants Forever purchased back in 2002. So this is private land, Pheasants Forever purchased. It's enrolled in the block management program in Montana. I would bet there are pheasants here because that's the type of habitat Pheasants Forever is working to conserve. So these are areas that they may still be private. A lot of times Pheasants Forever will transfer these to, a lot of times it's the state, especially like in Minnesota, I know a lot of them will become um, WMAs, wildlife management areas, or WPAs, waterfowl production areas with the US Forest, or uh, not Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, so those are just showing where those habitat projects have taken place. We also, so here's another example of one. This is an area Pheasants Forever's worked to conserve and make open to the public. Similarly, I'm going to get down where I remember there being. So here's an, a Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation where they helped acquire these parcels and transfer them to the Forest Service. So just kind of showing you where those projects have taken place. If you want to learn more information about any of those, you can click on it and it'll tell you some additional information there. So good question on the Pheasants Forever layer. Is weather conditions integrated into the app? Yes, we do have weather available. I'm gonna pull up my map here on mobile. Let me share that to show you what that looks like. So if I get back to Missoula, let me hide this. You see in the top right corner of my screen, there's a weather icon. I can tap on that and it's gonna give me the near, the forecast for the nearest weather station here. It's at the airport in Missoula. Tells me it's 68 degrees. Tells me sunrise, sunset date, which I use all the time for those legal shooting hours. I can get a weekly forecast for what's coming up and an hourly forecast. I can kind of scroll through and see what that's going to be. I can get the moon phase. I can get you know barometric pressure, all of that. Another way you can get this, and what I do most of the time, say I wanted to go hunting out in this area, I'm just going to tap on my map, and it's going to tell me you know low low national forest. If I scroll down, I can get the weather there as well along the bottom, or if I go up to the top where it says low low national forest, you see it says overview hunt unit and weather. 
If I tap on weather, it brings up that same information. And that's going to be to the nearest weather station to wherever I queried on the map. Wherever I tapped, it's going to bring that up. This information does get cached on your device. So if I go out there and I don't have any cell service, which is probably pretty likely for that area based on my experience, I'll have this information saved or cached on my device. It just won't update until I get cell service again, but I can still use it to tell, you know, sunrise, sunset, see, all right, you know, the, the forecast was this, that may still be accurate, that may not be, but at least it gives you an idea uh, when you don't have service there. Let's see. Would a CWD EHD map be helpful or discouraging if it was added? Um, we do have CWD distribution map in the map layers. So that one is in the current conditions folder. You can see CWD positive counties, CWD zones and locations. So that's gonna tell you areas where there's maybe carcass movement restrictions and areas where CWB has, CWD has been detected. Um, I find that helpful to know, hey, I'm hunting in an area where I can't take, you know, any bones out, for example. It's always a good idea, no matter where you're hunting, if you can, you know, don't transport brain tissue, spinal column tissue, those areas that, that contain those CWD prions, um, so that we're not accidentally introducing it into new areas, um, you know, kind of do your part there. EHD, I'm not sure that there is that data that's kept like CWD is. We work with the National Deer Association to, to have that CWD information in the map. Um, EHD, I'm not sure that there's that same sort of data set, but that's something to check out. It, it can be discouraging to your point there, Stephen, um, to see, man, look at all the areas that have CWD. Unfortunately, that's kind of the, the world we live in right now. We just all kind of have to do our part to, to make sure we're not introducing it to new areas. Let's see. Any way to have just boundary line on, but remove the shade area for public land. So you can turn off the government lands layer and leave on the private lands and it'll tell you where the private lands are. Um, there's not a way to have government lands on and the shading disappear completely, but you'll notice as you zoom in on the map on those government lands, it does become more transparent automatically. So when you really zoom in on a piece of forest service or state land, for example, you'll hardly notice that coloration once you get in close. So that's something to take a look at if you, if you find that kind of green or blue or yellow coloration a little distracting. Um, the other thing you can do is, is just turn that layer off. Don't forget to turn it back on when you want to see that shading though. Can you manually input coordinates to a waypoint? Good question. Yes, I'm going to show you how to do this. One second while this boots up here. So I'm going to go back online here. So you can do this on the mobile app, which is how most people do it. In the upper right hand corner, there's a above the weather, there's a search button. And I can, you're going to use the location bar, make sure private land isn't selected, make sure you have location. And then there's an example here, I'm just going to type this in. If you have the coordinates, use them in decimal format, that's the easiest. Type them in. Let's say I wanted to go to this area. I have this gray icon on my screen now. Okay. So that is where that coordinate is. What I can do is I can add a waypoint. Boom. There it is. I can save that. Now I have a waypoint on that area. If I close out, you can see it showing there. So you can search for coordinates and then just boom, put the waypoint there. You can search for Yellowstone National Park. You can search for a lake, a town, a county. You can search for private landowner name, 
all that's available to you in the search. You can also do that on the web map. The search is in the upper left-hand corner. Um, if your map layers menu is open, you do need to close it and you'll see the search bar there. Um, Arnold asks, can we watch this later when not at work? Yep, this is being recorded. So it will be up on the YouTube page here shortly. Let's see, a couple more. We're at an hour here. Um, Robert asks, how can someone suggest hunt zones specifically for military bases? Like Camp Pendleton has zones. And there are other military bases that also have zones. We have been working to add these at different bases. You know, let me double check. I think we might have Camp Pendleton. If I go into my layers here. So we do have Camp Pendleton. If you go into your California hunt zones layers, um, so let me back up again. So I'm in California, I have hunt zones. I hit view options. This is where you can turn on, you know, deer zone is selected by default. You can go down. We have Pendleton hunt areas, the duck zones, fishing areas. So we do have it for some bases. We're kind of finding we have to get them for military installations on a case by case basis. Some of them have that data digitized and are able to send it to us. Some of them don't. Um, there is another app. I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head um, that a lot of bases use. And they just either don't want to send us the data because they want to make sure people are using that one app that they that they work with or because they just don't have that data in the format that we can use. Um, but we're working on it. We would love to have all of the military installations that allow hunting. We would love to have all of those zones on there. It's just kind of trying to work with each specific base. Sometimes it's their biologist or whoever coordinates that to get that data. Um, but that is something we're working on. Good question. Um, Carl asks about sharing your location with a buddy. So one thing we are looking at is a live type of buddy tracker feature. Um, so there's, there's some other apps on the market that do a similar thing. Something we're looking at including in the future where let's say my brother and I are going out hunting. I give him permission to see my location. He gives me permission to see his. We can see like a dot on the map where each other are. It would only work when there is cell service because that information has to be communicated, you know, up to the cell tower and down to his device and vice versa to me. Um, what you can do if you just want to share where you're going hunting with a loved one. Let's say this waypoint here, for example, you know, obviously it's in the middle of town. Let's pretend it's not. And I have a significant other or a parent or, or a hunting partner, whoever, that I just want them to know where I am in case something were to happen. So what I can do is along the bottom of my screen here, there's this share button. I can tap that. I can share it with somebody. They're only able to view it. They can't edit it. And then this is a tablet, so it doesn't have texting on it. The most common way to share a location, to share a waypoint with somebody is to text it. You can email it. You can send it through Facebook or Instagram or whatever you want. You can send them a link that will open the, I'm just gonna cancel out of this, that will open that waypoint up on their map. So you can say, hey, this is where I'm parking. I'm gonna hike in, you know, in case, hey, if you don't hear from me by tonight, that's where I'm parked. So if, if the worst case scenario happens and they have to call, search and rescue or somebody, there's a starting point there. You can share waypoints for more fun reasons, like, hey, I got a deer down, I need dragon, here's where I am. Um, or, hey, here's the duck blind I want you to go to in the morning or the tree stand, here's where it is so they don't get lost in the morning. I'm going to stop sharing this so that I can, I'm gonna post the giveaway link in the chat. So open up the chat feature there so that you can get entered for that. That's going to be open until four o'clock mountain time today so that I can draw those winners tonight. If you're watching this video on YouTube after 
you know, September 6th, it's not going to be open. Sorry for that. Um, but if you are still live on here with us, make sure you get entered for that. We're giving away some pretty cool um, Onyx bandanas. And I will email the winners and get those shipped out um, by tomorrow morning. You'll have an email from me if you've won. Let's see. One more here. Let's see something we haven't haven't covered yet. Brian's heading to Michigan to hunt grouse and woodcock. Looking for updated habitat. I'm new at upland hunting, but hunting for 45 plus years. How can I maximize the app to find current habitat records? So for Michigan, what I would do, let me share my screen here one more time. I do have a soft spot in my heart for grouse and woodcock. I grew up uh, in Minnesota and hunting the north woods there for rough grouse. Um, so let me pull up the map here. I'm going to go to my hunt map layers. I'm going to scroll down. I'm going to turn on Michigan. So I'm going to go over to the UP here. No secret, there's rough grouse and woodcock in the UP. Go into my layers. What I'm going to have turned on, if I open up Michigan, I'm going to turn on the hunting access program, the forest program, the possible access. A lot of public land in the UP you may not need, you know, some of those walk-in programs. I'm going to go back to my layers. I'm going to go to trees, crops, and cover. I'm going to turn on timber cuts. And I'm going to turn on young aspen forests. That's the classic, you know, rough grouse, young aspen stands. So what that looks like when I zoom in here, that's this kind of purplish coloration. So that's going to tell me this is aspen. Um, typically that the young aspen, the line of demarcation for that is 15 years and younger. Um, so that's aspen that's been logged within the past 15 years so it's going to be those younger aspens that those birds like to eat the buds and that higher stem density for better cover there um trying to think what else you know in the up you might be looking for A another thing you could do is just look at you know some of the imagery and try to find different colorations just different vegetation colors, that different diversity. Grouse are creatures of the edge, much like deer and a lot of other animals are. Um, you know, so you can take a look and say, oh man, this is where, you know, maybe I turn on my deciduous coniferous layer. And I might say, I want to hunt, you know, where where the pine trees and the the aspen trees come together. Northern Minnesota growing up, a lot of times when it was rainy, we'd find the grouse under, it was a lot of balsam up there because um, they're able to kind of stay dry under there. But then it was also often next to some some aspen or some popple. Um, haven't hunted Michigan myself. Um, every place is a little unique. That's where I would start. Check out that young aspen layer. Check out some of the different tree species. Um, Hope you have some luck up there, Brian. And with that, I know we got a lot of questions in there I wasn't able to answer. We're gonna do these office hours about every two weeks through hunting season, as long as people are enjoying them and finding some value out of them. Um, again, if you had a question that was kind of specific to your account, something goofy going on there, um, something doesn't seem right with your password, billing, anything like that, help at onyxmaps.com. They'll be able to get you taken care of. Um, and again, We'll be doing another one of these classes September 21st. We're going to try to do them, do them at a little bit different hours. That next one's at 11 a.m. Montana, you know, mountain time. Um, you know, we got six, six different time zones in the U.S. We're going to try to move it around so that everybody can kind of try to, you know, hit that noon hour in different parts of the country. Um, and with that, I want to thank everybody again for joining us. Hope you enjoyed this. Hope you learned something and hope to catch you on the next one.